The magician duo Penn and Teller recently performed a trick on their TV show Fool Us where they had everybody watching at home pick a random number according to their instructions and then they somehow guessed that number. That sounds impossible, right? Well, this is at least what they claim to do and here's how the trick went. First, choose any number on the face of the clock that is a number between 1 and 12. If you have it, start going around the clock starting from position 12 and spelling out the name of your number letter by letter with each move. So for instance, if you chose the number 6, then you would spell S-I-X and finish at number 3. Now go ahead and do this with your own number and take note of where you end up. Now take whichever number you reached. Continuing from this position, start going around the clock again, now spelling this number. And then do this just one more time. Take the number you now reached and spell it out around the clock, continuing from your current position. You could have started with any number. There's no way for me to know what you chose. I mean, this is a recording. Yet, I am sure your final number is 1. Now, how does the trick work? You don't need to be familiar with magic to figure it out, because there's only one way it could work. In the beginning, you did have a truly free choice, so the only possible explanation is that somehow, regardless of what your first number is, these three simple instructions always take you to position 1. This isn't even a trick, really. There are no hidden mechanisms or illusions. It's just a phenomenon of the English language and the numbers around the clock. The reason it works so well as a trick is because it's really counterintuitive. Imagine your friend gets lost driving around at night looking for your house and calls you asking for directions. You'd first ask where they were, but imagine they couldn't tell you because it's too dark to read the street signs. Well, there's no way to navigate someone without knowing where they are, is there? Well, this is exactly what Penn and Teller did. They gave you instructions to get to the location 1 on the clock no matter your starting point. And it can work on a map too. Suppose this is the map of the town and your friend is at one of the intersections. These thinner roads are one-way streets and the thick ones can be traversed in both directions. Now, the map is such that at each intersection, there are exactly two possible roads your friend can legally take. If he were to turn to face these two roads, then one of them would be to his left and the other one to his right. You can thus use left-right directions to guide your friend down the roads you want him to take, which I've marked on the map with red for left and blue for right. Now I claim that regardless of where he is, you can direct your friend to your house in exactly three moves of left or right. Your route doesn't need to be the shortest possible one. In particular, it's fine if you send your friend down the same street they just came from, or even if they pass your house sometime during their drive. The important thing is that after the three moves, he should definitely be at your house, no matter where he started from. Hit pause and try to figure out how. The correct sequence is right, left, left. This is the only one that works from every point, and since there are only eight possibilities for the three moves, you can figure this out by just methodically checking all of them, but we'll later see more efficient ways. So that's pretty cool, but why does this work? So these phenomena are examples of a mathematical concept that's been studied for over half a century. In both cases, we had a number of initial possibilities, and then a sequence of instructions which send all of these possibilities to a specific one. In mathematical terms, we would say that the instructions are synchronizing. We will call these initial possibilities states. The instructions describe ways of going between the states, and as such they're called transitions and we can depict them by arrows. In the case of the map, the possible instructions were go left or go right. So we have these two types of arrows, which describe where the directions left and right take us. You may have missed it during the clock trick, but we had two kinds of instructions there as well. In the very first step, we were asked to spell our chosen number starting from 12. I'm going to call this instruction A, and these are the respective transitions. 
After the first step, the instruction changed. We had to spell the letters from the very number we were thinking of. I'll call this instruction B, and these are the respective transitions. You can figure these out by just performing the instructions on each number. The technical term for a diagram of states and transitions is automaton, and the reason they're called that is because you can think of them as computational devices and they come up in computer science. If you specify a given number on the clock, then this diagram can compute the number you get after a series of instructions. For instance, if you were curious what number you'd get if you started from 3 and performed the instructions A, B, A, A, B respectively, you no longer have to look at the clock and count out letters, you can just traverse the path in the diagram encoding the transitions A, B, A, A, B, and see that this results in 8. So this diagram automates that computation for you. Automata were first defined as theoretical models of computational devices and automated machines. They can be used to model anything which can exist in a finite number of states, and can transition between those states when prompted by an instruction. For instance, an elevator, your washing machine, or technically speaking, even your computer, though it's not very practical to think of it as such. It was not long after their introduction that computer scientists started to think about synchronization problems. That is, if you lose track of the state your machine is currently in, how do you recover from that? With the clock automaton, it's easy. You just tell the automaton to perform ABB, and as we've seen, that should definitely take it back to state 1. This makes ABB a so-called synchronizing word for the automaton. The notion was first defined in 1964 by a Slovak computer scientist called Jan Czerny, and largely because he published his ideas in Slovakian, it was then rediscovered by several other people later. Now suppose you wanted to perform the clock trick in a different language. Because this changes the names of the numbers, and thus what the instructions A and B do, the word ABB will, in all likeliness, no longer synchronize. But can you maybe come up with a different word that will, and if so, how would you do that? And equally importantly, how long can you expect the shortest such word to be? I mean, I doubt any audience member would want to sit through 100 moves around the clock. Well, these are exactly the kinds of questions that interested Jan Czerny and many mathematicians and computer scientists still, and even though they are very simple to state, quite surprisingly we still haven't managed to answer them in full generality. Nevertheless, there are some answers that I can give you. To make the problem concrete, let us actually consider the Spanish clock. We have the same two types of instructions as before, spell your current number from 12, or spell your current number from your current number itself, and we can, again, draw the respective automaton. Now we want a sequence of A's and B's which synchronize all the numbers on the clock to a single number. We don't care which one. Now previously, when I asked you to find a synchronizing word for the map, I suggested a kind of brute force algorithm to just methodically check all the different possibilities. But then I also told you that a synchronizing word existed and that it was of length 3, so that left you with only 8 possibilities to check. But this time, without that knowledge, we are left with an infinite amount of words which we cannot go through in a finite amount of time, so we need a better idea. Instead of one person choosing a random number, imagine that we have 12 different people choosing the 12 different numbers in the beginning. Let us try and track in a clever way where different sequences of instructions take this group of people. Remember, we want all of them to end up in the same place. Well, in the beginning, we either tell them to do A or B. Performing A sends them to 3, 4, 5, and 6. Performing B sends them to, well, these numbers. These are the possibilities after step 1. Moving on to the second step, let's see what happens if they do A again. Well, in the first case, our participants go to the state 4, 5, or 6. In the second case, well, it seems they just go to 3, 4, 5, or 6 again, which means that regarding synchronization, there is no difference between starting with A and starting with BA, because both pile our 12 participants to exactly the same four states, which we then have to synchronize. And this is the key idea. We don't actually need to check all the possible words of A's and B's individually. 
We only care about what performing A or B does to possible allocations of people. And an allocation is essentially just a subset of the numbers 1 through 12. And there are only finitely many of those, namely 2 to the 12, which granted is a much bigger number than A, but hey, it's finite. So as we continue building this diagram of subsets, performing A's and B's on the subsets obtained, we sometimes get a new subset, and we sometimes get something we already had. But since there are only finitely many subsets, we can't keep getting new ones forever and ever. Eventually, we'll have found all the ones that can arise. In the end, one of two things can happen. Either at some point we obtain a singleton, and then we say, yay, because that's what we wanted. The path we took to get there gives us a synchronizing work. The other possibility is that we never find a singleton, in which case we don't have a synchronizing work because having everybody at the same place is just not an allocation we are able to achieve. In the case of the Spanish clock, we do find a singleton after three steps. The word AAB sends everybody to 10, and this is the shortest synchronizing word. If we keep going, we also find other synchronizing words like ABAB or ABBBB and many others. But not all automata have synchronizing words. The simplest counterexample is probably this one. It has only one kind of transition which goes around the states in a cycle. If we start the algorithm as before, we immediately obtain that the single type of transition we have just doesn't change anything, so we never get any different subset than the full set. Automata with synchronizing words are called synchronizing automata. And you might think that they're quite rare, but actually they're not. Most automata with at least two types of transitions are synchronizing. And the word most here means that the probability of being synchronizing tends to one, as the number of states goes to infinity. But synchronization isn't very useful if it takes an unreasonably long time. So how long can we expect the shortest synchronizing work to be? One way to try and answer that question is thinking in terms of the method to find that shortest synchronizing work. In the diagram of subsets, how many non-singletons does it go through before it reaches its final singleton state? Well, it never visits the same subset twice, because if it did, we could just cut away the loop and end up with a shorter synchronizing word, but we said that this was the shortest one. So worst case scenario, it just visits all subsets of at least two elements once before it reaches a singleton. Can that happen? Well, unfortunately, there's no obvious reason it couldn't. And that's a really large number. That's almost all of the subsets, which is exponential in the size of the automaton. With n states, it's 2 to the n minus n minus 1, so for 12 that would be 4083. So that's certainly not practical for a magic trick or many other purposes. But Czerny, in his 1964 Slovakian paper, already noticed that in all of the examples that he could come up with, the length of the shortest synchronizing word was much, much shorter than this trivial exponential bound. For a synchronizing automaton with n states, it was always at most n minus 1 squared, which being a quadratic function of n rose way slower than the exponential one. In the following years, he became more and more convinced that this was the true upper bound, but just wasn't able to prove it, so in 1969 he formulated it as a conjecture. This is now known as the Czerny conjecture, and has been an open problem since. It has been confirmed for large classes of automata, but in general, the best proven bound we have is cubic, which is much better than the exponential bound, but far from the quadratic function of n minus 1 squared. We know that the bound cannot be lower than n minus 1 squared because there are examples of synchronizing automata where the length of the shortest synchronizing word is that. Actually, the first examples were given by Cherny in his original paper, and the funny thing is, we don't have many more of those examples since. It seems that even those automata are quite rare. Actually, it's been recently proved that for most synchronizing automata, the length of the shortest synchronizing word is a lot closer to a linear than to a quadratic function of n. And this also proves the Czerny conjecture for most synchronizing automata, where, again, the word most has a precise meaning that I won't state. But the thing is, most isn't all, and even just one counterexample could disprove the conjecture, which is still open. This is a bit like a magic trick that nobody's figured out yet. Go pick a synchronizing automaton, and Matt says, hey, I bet there's a synchronizing word in there with length at most n minus 1 squared. And you're like, 
What? You don't know that? Well, there's no reason that should happen. But it does. At least it did every time we checked so far. So you go home, puzzled, mesmerized, try to figure out why it happens, but nobody's managed to so far. And this is what researching mathematics feels like. Sometimes there are easy questions with very difficult answers, but that's all part of the mystery.